of Scripture with you, I invite you to the Gospel of Mark. We'll be there in just a moment, chapter 6, I'd like to read. But before that, I just want to say thank you to Tad Kyle. Where did Tad go? I'm looking for your hair. Um, there he is. Uh, we love our college students, and nothing thrills me more to hear college students come back and go, hey, I missed Highland Oaks. Hey, yay for us. I mean, that's a win for us, but I hope that we continue to build a reputation where we welcome people, even if they are of Muslim faith. You're welcome here. And I didn't want you to miss what one of our shepherds said, that it is the Holy Spirit that is leading the way. We're a church that believes in the Holy Spirit. It's not just some mysterious thing, even though it is a mysterious being. But yet that mystery lives in each and every one of us nudging us to be aware of the things of God. And that's exciting to be a part of. So Amir, thank you for being with us. James and Juanel, thank you for modeling that for us. Mark chapter 6, can begin in verse 45, conclude in verse 52. And then we'll see if God has a word. It's the word of God for the people of God. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. And Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. O oh God, may your words not just be heard but move take residence within us cut to the very parts of who we are God pour through me the gift of story of teaching and imagination as we learn what it means to follow you it's in your name that we pray amen it's an interesting way to start, don't you think? The disciples who have been following Jesus for some time are doing what fishermen do. They're out on a lake, straining ever so hard against wind that will not die down, and then they see someone walking on the water. That would terrify me as well. But I have to imagine that there was something in them that didn't just think it was a ghost, but could this be the Messiah, the one that we were following? And they're terrified. They're fearful. And, and what's so bizarre about this story is that this is not the first time this has happened, that the disciples are fearful, even though they know Jesus, know him as in this is the person that was just with us that morning. And you know, I'd like to cut the disciples a break because I think we would as well. But there's an interesting piece to this story that I honestly hadn't noticed. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Why would Mark include that detail? They're terrified of the wind and there's something about what had just happened earlier that should have informed them on how to behave in the present. 
Something about this all too familiar story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people. Because I think it matters where you sit. You ever been to a Rangers game? This is usually the view I have. Go ahead, first slide. Yeah, I mean, it's like nosebleed section, right? And what really aggravates me is they do those contests that I think are rigged, and they call out your number, your name, and oh, the special so-and-so. They get to move down to a seat like this. And that is so unfair, because I want to pay $8 for a seat and get to sit right behind home plate, wouldn't you? Because your perspective of the game changes depending on where you sit. The disciples are sitting in the boat, but they had just previously been sitting in the grass. And I think it matters because you're going to view Jesus depending on where you're sitting, whether it's in the boat or in the grass. So the view from the boat does not begin with Jesus walking on the water. It begins with Jesus in the green grass. Go back with me earlier to Mark chapter 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to him all they had done and taught. So many people were coming and going. They did not even have a chance to eat. Trust me, if I'm a disciple, I am grumpy. Do you get grumpy when you're hungry? Nod yourself this way. Yeah. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But everyone saw them leaving and recognized them, ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed, he said, Would you please go away? We are starving. That is not what Mark says. When Jesus landed, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them for they were like sheep without a shepherd and he taught them many things. I think this detail that Mark includes frames this entire story. I think this detail, when Jesus landed and saw them, they were like sheep without a shepherd. I think this makes all the difference in the world, and it's what the disciples missed when they were terrified on a lake seeing Jesus himself coming toward them. And I'd like for just a few moments to tell you why. Why it matters. That Jesus is not just some person, but rather Jesus is a particular type of person. And to use Mark's language, Jesus is a particular type of shepherd. He's a shepherd king. The reason I know this is that if you go back to Mark chapter 1, Jesus announces his ministry with the following. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near Repent and believe the good news. There's something about the coming of Jesus that signals to everyone around Jesus that this is not about just the agenda of a person. This is the agenda of a king that has a kingdom to establish. And all who hear are going to understand how that king operates. Are you with me? This is not just a story about Jesus. This is a story about king Jesus. As one contemporary writer has just written a book a few years ago, it's the King Jesus Gospel, and I like that. Because we can't miss this detail. It's the King Jesus Gospel. As opposed to all the other kings, he is the only king that matters, and it's the way that he's a king that ought to matter most. And in this story of King Jesus, Jesus, the king shepherd that sees his sheep and he wants to teach them something. It's important that we acknowledge that Jesus is a king bearing kingdom news, kingdom authority. And this particular king is operating in a way that, well, it's like Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao. It's an intense fight. Because if you'll notice in your Bibles, there's a story of another king right before this one. 
The king's name is Herod. I could give you details from the annals of history about this particular king. Details that would make you think Adolf Hitler was a junior dictator. Herod was ruthless. So ruthless that he decided to grant one of his family members anything she wanted. And you know what she requested? The head of a prophet. John the Baptist on a platter. And you can read the story yourself, but let me paraphrase it. King Herod didn't want to be embarrassed, so he did whatever she said. And she sent to have a prophet of God executed. Ruthless power. Ruthless control. Doing everything he can to keep people aware that he is king and everybody ought to march in line because if you disobey that king, your head comes off. That's the story Mark tells immediately preceding this one. So if I could add to what Mark is saying in chapter 6, I don't think it's when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. I think it's when King Jesus lands and sees a large crowd. Because we're reading this story just like Mark's hearers are reading this story and we have to hear it the way Mark's hearers, I think, heard it. Which is in direct contrast to the story immediately before. Because King Jesus is not King Herod. When King Jesus lands, he sees the crowd and has compassion on them because they are like sheep without a shepherd. Some of you who have been reading the Bible a lot longer than I am know that that sounds familiar. Sheep without a shepherd. That's the story of Israel, isn't it? Would you like to know that this was what the prophet spoke when evil, ruthless King Ahab was leading Israel. Ahab was on the throne. And the prophet over in 1 Kings comes and says, Oh Ahab, you've missed it because Israel, when you're in charge, are like sheep without a shepherd. Direct contrast to the type of king God intends. What kind of king is this? I think the feeding of the 5,000 tells us what kind of king this is. First of all, I want us to just wrap our minds around the fact that this is a king who has power, but uses his power in a particular way. It, it's not for evil. It's not for self-gain. But rather, it's to promote what is good. What is good for the kingdom. And what is good for the kingdom of God is not what is good for the kingdom of Herod. It reminds me of the following Disney movie. You know, I, I, I don't want to apologize, but man, I get all kinds of ideas from movies that I watch. And do you remember this? You think it's about a cute little lion that's lost? You know, parenthetically, why would Disney make a movie where the dad dies right on the screen? I mean, come on. You know how difficult it is for me to unpack that with my children? Anyway, so Simba and Scar are competing for the pride land, the throne. And I think the movie is so much more about good triumphing over evil. It's rather about how that power is going to be exercised. When King Jesus lands, he has compassion. So what does he do when the people are hungry? When the king himself is hungry? He feeds them. Now Mark just says there's 5,000 people. Well, that's just 5,000 men if you read it a particular way. We're talking 10 to 15,000 people. We treat this story as a punchline, don't we? You ever been in a restaurant? Somebody orders fish? Hey, if Jesus were here, he'd feed the whole restaurant. <laughs> This is not a punchline story. This is something about Jesus telling us something about God and the kingdom of God. Because when King Jesus lands, he sees the crowd and he has compassion on them and he gives them what they need. 
And for me, that is revolutionary. I want to believe in that kind of king because I think we're still in a fight. We're still in a fight about who our leader is. And some of us think that our leader is found in who the next president of our country is going to be. No, friends, that's not the story of the scripture. Our leader is King Jesus. It's a kingdom that supersedes any earthly kingdom. God is on the throne regardless of who is president. Doesn't that make you glad? It ought to. Because when King Jesus lands, and when he sees us, there's not an ounce of self-gain. And Paul taught the church in Philippi to sing, and it's a song that goes like this, who being in the very nature did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he counted himself nothing, taking the form of a what? A servant. That's our king. That's the king, Jesus. But I love how he exercises his power. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a very remote place, and it's already very late. Like Jesus didn't know that already. <laughs> Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Does it strike you as odd that the disciples are telling Jesus what to do? There's more. So Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. See, that's what happens when we try to tell the king what to do. He looks at us and says, well, if you think you can do it just as well as I can, why don't you fix it? Well, they said to him, that would take almost a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Parenthetically, Jesus says, of course not, you bunch of dummies. How many loaves do you have? Go and see. King Jesus lands. When they found out, they said five and two fish. And you know how the story goes. They sit down in groups and Jesus feeds them all. He's using his power in a particular way. Because when it comes to Jesus, Jesus is full of compassion. And he sees what people need. And he provides it. By, by using people like us. Isn't that bizarre? That Jesus is intentionally using us to model what the kingdom looks like. King Jesus reminds me of this person. His name is Dan Price. He started a little company called Gravity out in the West Coast. Dan Price wasn't a household name until a couple of weeks ago. Do you know why? Because Dan Price has an annual salary of around a little over $1 million. But the average income of everyone in his company was about $45,000. Dan Price called his company together and announced that he would be taking a $1 million pay cut and increasing every person that works for him to at least $65,000 per year. True story. Go look it up. And I think every CEO in the country looked at Dan Price and said, are you crazy? That's a brilliant marketing strategy. But you know what I think Dan Price thought? I'm crazy to keep all this money for myself. Because real power is only power if it's shared with the people who work alongside of me. When King Jesus lands, he's not there to show off the flexus muscles and demonstrate how powerful he is. He rather gathers his disciples together and says, hey, let's do this together. Go find some loaves and some fish. Let's see what we can do together because that's what the kingdom of God does. King Jesus could have done this by himself, right? He's God. Nod your head this way. It'll go faster. King Jesus could have done this by himself, but instead he chooses fishermen from Galilee of all places. These aren't even the best or the brightest. These are lowly fishermen that God uses to say, this is the kingdom story. And finally... 
taking the five loaves, the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he breaks the loaves. He gave them to his disciples, set before the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. Don't you love that little detail? They all ate and were satisfied. And this is the point in the message where some of you should get nervous. Oh, Jesus always gives us anything we need and we eat and we're satisfied. Well, I wish life worked like that. But here's what I think Mark is trying to tell us. That when you live life with King Jesus, it doesn't remove you from difficulty. It doesn't remove you from the hard pace of life. But what it does is it guarantees that you'll have a seat at the table and there'll always be something to eat. It reminds me of this. As some of you know, I grew up on a farm. This is a John Deere tractor, much like the one that I learned to drive. Actually, I didn't learn to drive one like this. It was a lot less fancy. Hours upon hours of driving with nothing but me, the sky, and my voice to entertain me. That's pretty boring. And I used to look at my job on the farm and just like, this, this is just awful. But as I look back on it, and I began talking to my friends that came and worked on the farm, they loved it. I thought they were drinking some weird Kool-Aid, and I would just ask them, why do you like working on the farm? I said, well, Pat, it's amazing. Your mom makes the best food. And there's always something to do. When King Jesus lands... There's always something to eat. There's always something to do. Which is why that it is so frustrating to look just a few hours later and the disciples are minding their own business in the boat and they're terrified and scared to death. Which is perhaps why Jesus said, take courage it is I, don't be afraid. And then Mark looks back on that and says, well, the view from the boat is that they just didn't understand about the loaves. Church, this is not a story about Jesus working his magic and feeding a bunch of people even though that would be a good Bible story. This is a story of trust. And when we are seated on the grass, joining Jesus in His kingdom work, not just giving, but also receiving the good food that our King provides, it enables us to have a view from the boat. And when the waters around us get testy, we can learn and take courage and not be afraid. We come here to be fed so that we can enter back out onto the water. We come here to sit in these seats to worship, to learn from the King Jesus every Sunday before we are dismissed. Do you realize what we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't just pray that because it's fun. We pray that because we believe it. Because Jesus was saying something about our role as followers, our role as disciples. This is the King Jesus we are following. And some of you are in the fight of your life with cancer treatments. Some of you are in the fight of your life with job searches. Some of you are in the fight of your life because your family situation couldn't be worse. And you're in the boat. And I think Jesus would want you to know that he's there and he's walking on the water. He's coming towards you. Take courage. It is I. 
Do not be afraid. And some of us are sitting in the grass and we feel used, we feel consumed by the presence of King Jesus. And we can feel Him working alongside of us, providing food for those and eating for what God gives. And we're grateful. But I think Jesus would say the same thing to us. Don't forget that I'm still the King. It's a matter of trust. Who will we choose to follow? Let those who have ears to hear, hear the words of God.